Hello everyone. Welcome to another Word for the Moment video blog. I got a little bit of an unusual message today uh, to share with you uh, as we start really this new season. For us, I should say, we've already been in the new season, but seems like uh, there's been a greater sense of clarity that's been given concerning this new season that we're in. We've been prophesying about it for the last year, so it's not like this is something brand new. But as we were coming to the end of, of this last year, and I began to ask the Lord, what is this new season going to look like? For me, at least, something unusual was taking place. And normally, I focus on a year. You know, what are you going to do in this next year? Kind of got that from Bob Jones. You know, I did so many of the shepherd's rides with Bob on the Day of Atonement. You know, revelations would come to the two of us and we would join them together. And I wrote the Shepherd Drives for 14 years. And it was primarily a focus on the next year and the things that would follow. I, we have discovered that many of those words um, had more application and more insight for the years that followed, even for the, for the next year. Sometimes the Lord gives us a word and gives us tokens in the next season, the next year of the validity of the word, but then the fullness of it unfolds as time goes on. Well, that's kind of the way this has been, except for the fact that the Lord did not speak to me about a year, but He has been speaking to me about decades, <laughs> this next decade. He was more interested in talking to me about this next decade and even the following decade than, than He was the next year, that, that I were to broaden our focus a little bit that we've entered into a whole new season and this whole decade will be characterized by certain attributes. This entire, let me say that again, this next decade will be characterized by certain divine attributes that will be exhibited over the course of the next several years. So it's not going to be limited to a 12-month period. And, and to be honest, as I have said often, I believe the revelations and the insights that are being given will be from now until the end of the age. They're going to just continue on. I, I believe every revelation will continue to have layer upon layer of understanding and insight as a body of people are being prepared to manifest the kingdom on the earth before the Lord returns. Most of you that have watched my blogs know I don't believe we have as many years left as many are prophesying. I know I've heard the 100-year prophecies and all of those things. My belief is that we're in the season of human history in which the Lord will return. Um, and, and I believe over the next you know, 18, 19, 20 years, we're going to begin to see the evidence of that. I'm not prophesying when the Lord's returning, but I am, we are sons of light. The Bible says that day's not to overtake us like a thief in the night. We're sons of light. We're supposed to know when the Lord's returning, the season of time. No man knows the day or the hour, but we are men and women of light, men and women that have the Holy Spirit. And we're supposed to know. We're supposed to have a sense of expectation of when the Lord is coming. You know, the Lord came to the earth and He rebuked the leaders of His day. He said, you can tell the weather, you know, if it's a red sky at night, you know, you know what the weather's going to be like the next day and red sky in the morning, you know what the weather's going to be like. But He said, but you don't even discern the day of your own visitation. And so we're supposed to be discerning. And I do believe that we are to preach the expectancy of the Lord's return. Everything we do, I'll take that one step further, everything we do from now until then is to prepare a people for the Lord's return. Now, that includes the harvest, of course, but there must be a body of people. You know, I, I uh, alluded in the last blog to a dream I had had, <laughs> and uh, I kind of backed out of it a little bit, decided not to go as much into it as I had initially thought I might in the last blog. But, but I think I'll just share a little bit more in this blog about it. But I, a, little, a few days ago, just a few days ago, I had an amazing, wonderful dream. And in the dream, I had this conversation with William Branham. Now, most of you know I believe William Branham was a great prophet. I know there's all kinds of things written, and I've addressed that many times. And most of you know my position. I believe he was a great man of God. I believe he was a messenger. And I believe what he brought by the Spirit was, is crucial for our day. It's non-negotiable. It is, it is a valid, necessary revelation to prepare a people to move forward into what we're going to do in our generation. 
But here's the thing about Brother Banner. Brother Banner's been gone 54 years. A whole new generation of people have been born on the earth. We can't just refer people back to say, oh, go listen to this message from 1960-something. We need to be able to preach the message ourselves, and with the message comes a ministry. The message and the ministry of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven does not consist in words only, but also in power. And one of the things that we discussed in, my, in this dream, and in the dream it seemed like it went on for hours, and he was talking to me about his message. And he expressed to me in this dream how disappointed he was in the ways that many have handled his message and the importance of handling the message with accuracy and balance. And, of course, I have preached much of the truth you know, that he brought. And he thanked me in the dream for bringing it with balance. Of course, it's my dream, so you know, I guess you know, he's going to say a good thing to me about it. But... But there has been excess. There has been fanaticism that has surrounded him and his ministry. And, and one of the things that broke his heart is how people would take one little phrase of something he said and build entire doctrines around it. And, and, and we're missing the point. He was a man just like you and I, but he was a forerunner. He said so himself, a forerunner of a company. He even prophesied that the power he had, which was the most... Some historians say that anyone had on their life since the early church. But he said there's a day coming down the road when a body of people will emerge that will have the kind of power that would make what he had seem small or simple. And just think about that for a minute. Just think about the tremendous miracles and the words of knowledge, as they call them, and the insight and the, the miraculous. If you listen to the series, the Supernatural series, uh, which chronicles his life, you'd think, how in the world could that much supernatural activity happen in the life of one person? But it did. I believe it. I believe it's validated. I believe those things are true. And I believe when he stood up and said, thus saith the Lord, it was, thus saith the Lord. That's my belief. But I also believe we have to approach that message with the eyes of the Spirit and balance it with the Scripture. He, was a, he always pointed people to the Word. And one of the things he prophesied, was that the earth has not yet seen the bride's revival. And that's kind of what that whole message was about, the dream about the bride's revival, about a body of people that have been through a process that are being prepared for something significant. There's been many expressions of church revival, but never one that was characterized by the attributes defined in Scripture by the Bride of Christ, the Bride Revival, the Greater Works Revival, the Restoration of All Things Revival, the Tasting of the Good Word of God and the Powers of the Age to Come Revival. Now, why am I saying that? Because here's my sense. This is what I have been feeling. Every time I start to ask the Lord about the next year, He talks to me about the next decade and even the next two decades. But then he also takes me back 20 years. So I've gone forward 20 years and I've gone backwards 20 years. And much of the, the revelation that we brought, you know, back in those years, I wrote a book, Thrones of the Soul, right around the year 2000, almost exactly 20 years ago uh, right now. And much of what I'm hearing from the Lord has been pulled out of that book. And I'm like, could it be, Lord, that now you're going to do those things in a greater way than that was even than even when it was written 20 years ago. And that was all about the preparation of the soul, the preparation of us for something significant, the cleansing of the soul, the sanctification of the soul. One of the experiences I had back at the time I wrote that book was what I call the battlefield vision. I'll just give a synopsis of it, a very short version of it, but it was so powerful that we were on a battlefield, we being the army of God, and we had a sword. I had a sword in my hand. I was standing among many people. And we were fighting on a battlefield. And the only scene I can kind of give you to portray the image of it was Braveheart. If you've noticed how the armies clashed on the battlefield and it was brutal and bloody. <laughs> and here we were on this battlefield and we were pushing the enemy back and pushing the enemy back one step at a time with our sword in our hand. And we got to a certain point. I was in this battle. It was so real. 
I really thought at the time I was on a battlefield. It wasn't like a dream or a vision or an experience. I thought I was really there. And I was fight, fighting the enemy back, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit withstood me. The Holy Spirit. It's like my feet were stuck, and the enemy was just feet away. But I could not advance any further to deal with the enemy. And I said, Lord, why have you, res- why have you stopped us? Why have you brought this battle to an end for the moment? And when I said that, I looked up, and right above me, the skies parted, just rolled back like a scroll, and I saw all the guns of the enemy, all the, the power of the enemy pointed down on the battlefield. And I knew that we were not actually winning the battle. We were being enticed into a battle we were not yet ready for. Listen carefully. I, won't, I don't want to lose anyone here. There is a preparation necessary to move in the kind of power that's going to be necessary to bring in the greatest harvest the earth's ever seen. If God's going to put that kind of authority on your life, He's going to put that kind of power on your life. He's going to have to refine you so that you use the power to advance the kingdom, not all the other agendas that happen in the lives of men. And so I saw that and I saw that that I was being enticed. If I had crossed this line, everything that the enemy had was going to come crashing down on us and we were not quite prepared for that. So immediately I I found myself being sucked right up off the battlefield. And the only word I can give, I'm just giving, you know, adjectives to try to give you a mental image of what it might have looked like, but I was in what looked like an operating room. And I saw a table over here, and there were seven or eight angels around the table working feverishly. So I walked over to this table that seemed like it was in heaven. And the angels were taller than me because I had to put my hands on their shoulders and I pull myself up to look over their shoulders to look down on the operating table and I saw it was me. I was on the table. And they were working feverishly, stripping away layer after layer of flesh. And so I stepped back for just a moment, you know, while they worked. (laughs) And so I stepped back up a second time and I put my hands on the shoulders of two of the angels and I pulled myself over and I looked again and There was nothing there except a little orb of light that was pulsating. Just this little golden colored, amber colored orb of light that was kind of pulsating. And I said, where am I? And the angel said, right there. And he pointed to that little orb of light. And I knew that was the seed of God. All that was left was the seed of God. They had stripped away all the flesh, all the agendas, all the ambitions, all the insecurities, all the doubts, and all those things. And all that was left was the seed of God that was imparted into us before the foundation of the world, that seed that contained His invisible attributes, His divine nature, and His eternal power. So I stepped back again, and they started working just as feverishly as before, but this time they were putting flesh back on the seed. (laughs) But it wasn't the flesh of humanity, it was bone of His bone, flesh of his flesh, the Lord's. And it was being put back together. And I came back a third time and there I was back again. I looked just the way I had. Of course, you got to realize this is my, my revelation. So I'm seeing myself, but I'm, I'm applying that to any one of you that have been prepared for what's coming. There has been a stripping away, then an adding back to us bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And when they were done, I stood up and I looked like myself, but it was not the same constitution. It was, I was made out of a different material. And as I said in the last blog, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh and the lust thereof. That's what this is all about, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, being galvanized with Christ, wearing Him like a cloak. Yes, He's on the inside and He's on the outside. The Lord Jesus Christ wearing us like a glove and coating us with His very nature so that the things of this world cannot penetrate to cause us to use the anointing for anything other than to glorify the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I stood up off the operating table and I, this, was the, this was the fun part. <laughs> and I said, where's my sword? Because I knew I was going back to the battlefield. I knew I was about to be sent back to the battlefield. I said, where's my sword? And the angel says, you have no sword. You are the sword. (laughs) And of course, that's Zechariah. We'd have the sword of the Spirit, but we are the sword in the Lord's hand. 
And so this is where I believe we have been. You know, Joseph received a prophetic word. Most of you have received powerful prophetic words, and the opposite has happened. (laughs) Just the very opposite of what the word was. You're to call to win nations and, you know, heal the sick and all the different things we've had prophesied over our life. Me too. Then it seemed like we've been through a 20-year cycle where the opposite happened. (laughs) You know, I've had a lot of meetings between 2000 and 2017 or 16 or 17 And the Lord has done a lot of wonderful things, but I knew I was never yet doing what the Lord had ordained for my life. I knew that. Joseph received a prophetic word that he was going to be a man of authority and that nations would bow down to him, that his own family would bow down. Of course, he didn't have the wisdom but to tell them that they would bow down and serve him. But in the very next thing he knows, he he has this word about ruling and having authority, and he goes to prison. (laughs) thrown into prison where he has no authority. He had no rights, completely subject to to someone that spent years in prison. The Bible tells us in Psalm 105 that the word of the Lord, he was in chains and fetters. Joseph was in chains and fetters for the word of the Lord tested him until the time came for the word of the Lord to come to pass. I really believe that's where we've been. My sense my sense, my hope, is that now this next decade we will begin to see the incredible fulfillment of the promises that have been that the bride will emerge with serious authority and real power, but more so with purity. That's what I'm sensing. That there will be a pure bride of Christ, that the sons of the kingdom will begin to emerge and begin to do everything that's been prophesied, that we're no longer going to be chains and chains and fetters where the word of the Lord has tested us, but many are going to emerge from this season and they're going to be a sword in the Lord's hand. That's where I believe we have been. And we have to forecast, uh, you know, pastors and leaders that have been writing to us and asking, what is the Lord saying? We, you know, don't plan for the next year, plan for the next decade. Set, set vision for the next decade. But I believe this decade is going to be, I believe it's going to be glorious. I do. I do. I don't believe we have as much time left as many are saying. So these things have to begin to come to pass. It's very much like it was when Moses was told to bring the people out and take them in. But he didn't take them in. He only brought them out, which is how I relate Brother Branham. I feel like Brother Branham was commissioned in the order of Moses. On May 7th, 1946, the angel Lord comes to him in this cabin deep in the woods of Indiana, three o'clock in the morning, after he had wept, he had no more tears left in him, and a ball of fire comes into the cabin. And if that's not enough to make you nervous, he said, I heard the footsteps of a man walking across the floor, and a man, now just envision that, you're in a cabin in the deep woods by yourself. No running water, no electricity, and a man walks in and stands under this ball of fire that's throwing light down on the floor. And this man, who was six feet in height, had olive complexion, hair down to his shoulders, wearing a white robe, and standing there barefooted, said, Fear not. (laughs) I wonder why the angels always say that when they come. Fear not, for I am sent from the presence of Almighty God to tell you that your peculiar life and your misunderstood ways or because you're to carry the gift of healing to the nations of the earth. And Brother Branham spoke up and said, How? He, and the angel said, you're going to pray for kings and princes and monarchs. He says, how can I? I'm a poor man. I'm uneducated. How can I pray for kings and princes and monarchs? And the angel said, as Moses was given two gifts, so also will you. And so forth the commission goes. So my point in saying all of that is that he was commissioned in the order of Moses. Moses ministered 40 years. Now, this is where some people might have a little bit of a hard time, but I'm going to say it anyway. Brother Branham ministered 20 years. Under that commissioning, he ministered 20 years. I believe it's a 40-year commissioning. And I I believe that whole era of time was cut short. What was called the latter rain revival, the voice of healing revival, I believe it was cut short. Why? Because of the failures of, of men. Because the people came out, but they didn't go in. There, uh, there's many reasons why, and, and, and it wasn't necessarily the failure of leaders. I, don't, I do not subscribe to the idea that Brother Branham's life was taken because he was in some kind of heresy or apostasy. I do not believe that for one second. 
I believe his life was cut short as Moses was because the people would not. The people would not yet go in. And there's much that can be said to prove that. And I have felt for some time, for some time, that there's another 20-year extension of that ministry that we saw back in the 1940s and 50s right up into the 1960s. That the fullness of it, the fruition of it, and as much as it was with Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am given to them, to the sons of Israel. Then he goes on, the Lord goes on to say to Joshua, No man, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you, and I will not fail you or forsake you. I will not fail you or forsake you. And I can't read that without going to verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I'm holding on to that. That's going to be my banner for the next season. I'm believing the Lord has, un I believe He has a new generation. And we're not going to do things the way they were done back then. We've said that many times before. If we're expecting it to look just the way it did, you know, 50 years ago, I believe we're going to be mistaken. I don't believe it's going to look the way it did. Joshua's ministry did not look like Moses. But Joshua had his burning bush experience. It just didn't, it wasn't a burning bush. It was the captain of the host. You know, you have to say, okay, if Moses was commissioned at the burning bush, Joshua had the same spirit that was on Moses. Where was his commissioning experience? He had one, but the Lord said, I've already done the burning bush thing. I'm not doing that one again. I'm going to appear now as the captain of the host with a drawn sword. <laughs> I'm going to show you a different attribute. You're going to, I'm going to be with you as I was with Moses, but what you're going to see demonstrated is not going to look like it did when, the, when Moses came. We've got the law. We don't have to do that again. We, we're going to occupy now. We're going to take names. <laughs> you're going to, I'm going to give you an occupying anointing. That was a word I brought some time ago, occupy in 2020. And I believe that, occupying in the 2020s. Because there is this overcomer's anointing that's being given. God's going to reveal a different attribute of His nature. And this body of people will begin to walk in the fullness of that as we move into this season. So my prayer is, Lord, be with us as you were with Moses, if you will. Let the Elishas emerge that have the spirit that was on Elijah. Let the Joshuas emerge that have the spirit like it was on Moses. We're not going to do it the same way. We're not going to emulate their methods and formulas and all those things. We're going to have the anointing of the Spirit and produce a new thing and carry this commission to the fullness and the fruition for which it was intended. That's my prayer. That's what I am going to believe for. That's what Amy and I and White Dove Ministries, we're going to believe for that in this next season of, of church history that we're moving into. So Lord, I pray. I'm just going to pray. I, I, when I said overcomers, I felt some anointing that the overcomers anointing would come upon every person watching this block. That you would overcome the spirit of the age. You would overcome fear. You would overcome tragedies and disappointment. You would overcome grief and hope deferred and all the things that have tried to shackle you like Joseph was shackled in the prisons and the dungeons, chains and fetters. May the chains and fetters be broken off now by the overcomer's anointing. For the word of the Lord has tested your people, but now it's time for the word of the Lord to come to pass. That word prepared Joseph for him to stand up. And for 80 years, he was only prepared for a few years. Then when he was ascended to the throne, he ruled for 80 years in the glory of God. Lord, I pray that we can rule from this point forward, that we can live, I should say, in the glory of God from now until the end of the age. That is my prayer for myself, my family, my ministry, and for you. Grant that, Lord, I ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.